Known most famously as Julie Daubigny, she was born around the year 1673 in Paris. Julie came from a middle class background as her father, Gaston Daubigny, worked as a secretary to one of France's most important men, Louis de Larenguis, Count of Armagnac, the master of the horse for King Louis XIV. Meanwhile, information regarding her mother is completely unknown, leading many to speculate that she likely died soon after giving birth to Julie. Aside from his work, Julie's father Gaston was known to be skilled with a sword, as well as being a womanizer. His character and the fact that Julie was without a mother had a huge impact on her early life and the woman she grew up to be. Due to her father's work, which also involved training the king's pages, little Julie received a far better education than most, as the majority of the population was illiterate. She was fortunate to be taught by several tutors in all sorts of subjects, from drawing and dancing to writing and literature. From an early age, her father also ensured that she learned to use a sword. During the 17th century, dueling was a very common practice in France. In the 1630s, Cardinal Richelieu complained that duels have become so commonplace in France that the streets are turning into battlefields. It was due to this that the practice was banned. However, Gaston knew that in order to properly prepare Julie for life, she would need to defend herself. In time, Julie would become an excellent duelist. This was thanks to consistent training, good teachers, and her quick, nimble movement. It should also be stated that as a girl, Julie fought her male counterparts as equals, something virtually unheard of at the time. All of this prepared Julie for her turbulent and dangerous adventures. Julie was described to have grown into a very attractive young woman, with soft facial features and a slender build. Her father's employer, the Count of Armagnac, noticed how she developed into a beautiful young woman, and when Julie was around 15, she became his mistress. The affair lasted around two years. Gaston's opinion on this is unknown. In any case, intervening in the liaison could have lost him his job, so all he could do was keep quiet. Sadly, Gaston died around this time, yet it seems he managed to get through to the Count of Armagnac before his death, because he soon arranged for Julie to wed Sieur de Marpin in order to protect her reputation. However, the wedding was just to keep up with appearances, as before long, or, according to some accounts, the day after the wedding, Sieur de Marpin was sent to work in Toulouse in tax administration. Meanwhile, Julie, now known as Madame de Marpin or La Marpin, remained with her older, more powerful lover, the Count of Armagnac. Whether the Count was glad that she remained in Paris with him is unknown, as her strong, rash personality was a lot for the older man to handle. Her husband was far away, and she soon fell deeply in love with an assistant fencing master named Henri Seran. Soon after this, the couple made their way to Marseille. There are various stories which relate why they left Paris, yet the most popular version tells that Seran got into an illegal duel and ended up killing his opponent. The Lieutenant General of Police, Gabriel Nicolas de la Reine, caught wind of this and started to track Seran down with the aid of his police force, so he had to flee in order to avoid being executed. While on the road south, the couple gave fencing exhibitions and sang at local taverns in order to earn enough to get by. It was at this point in time when Julie began to wear male clothing and openly expressed her bisexuality. Yet, it should be stated that many women cross-dressed while travelling, as it made it much safer and simpler. Julie would wear male clothing at these impromptu shows with Seran, but she made no attempt to disguise the fact that she was a woman. One story tells of a man who refused to believe 
that any woman could fight as well as Julie did. Thus, he shouted out saying that she had to be a man. In response, Julie tore open her shirt, exposing her chest, and the man was silenced. Julie's seeing success in small shows made her dream of a career in the opera. Julie believed she could accomplish this in Marseille, as a few years prior, the Marseille Academy of Music had been founded by Pierre Gaultier. Despite never having had a singing coach, Julie was gifted with a wonderful mezzo-soprano voice, so when she auditioned for the Academy, she easily passed. However, admission at the time wasn't all that difficult, as Seran was also hired. In Marseille, she performed as Mademoiselle Daubigny, experiencing near instant success thanks to her beauty, her acting abilities and her powerful voice. Nevertheless, her time in Marseille would come to an end after she found true love. Julie's stardom in the city attracted the attention of many admirers and as she dressed as a man, many of these were young women. Eventually, she fell madly in love with one of her fans, whose name is believed to be Cecilia Bortegali. However, the two young women weren't at all discreet and it wasn't long until Cecilia's parents found out about her relationship. In response, they sent her to a convent in order to protect the family reputation. The Bortegalis believed that was the end of that, yet they underestimated young Julie's tenacity. Without hesitation, she packed up her things left Marseille and travelled alone to the convent in Avignon where her beloved Cecilia was waiting. Upon arrival, she pretended to be interested in becoming a nun and was promptly accepted. Julie was finally reunited with her love, but of course, as they were in a convent, they had to be careful. The pair waited for a good chance to escape, which would finally come after the death of an elderly nun. The couple discreetly unearthed the corpse and transported it to Cecilia's bed. After this, they set fire to the room and just as planned, the flames provoked disarray in the convent. The ensuing chaos gave the couple the perfect cover to flee and the burnt bed and corpse would make all believe that Cecilia perished as a result of the flames. Sadly for Julie, subsequent investigations suggested that she was behind this. Julie was then called to court, but as she didn't appear, she was tried in absentia. During the trial, evidence was presented to prove her guilt. As a result, she was sentenced to death by the stake. It should be noted that during the proceedings, she was tried as a man in order to further avoid shame among the Bortegali family. Within a few months, the previously passionate relationship fizzled out. Cecilia made her way home. Meanwhile, Julie travelled north to Paris. To get by, she stopped in taverns on her way, singing and dancing, enjoying life. Yet, her journey home wasn't without its dangers. While in a tavern outside the city of Tours, Julie was challenged by three drunkards to a duel. She defeated the men with ease eventually stabbing one of them straight through the shoulder, thus ending the brawl. As it turned out, the man she had stabbed was the prominent aristocrat Louis-Joseph d'Albert, future Duke de Luynes. Julie found out about this, and in turn, the future Duke discovered that the person he had duelled was actually a woman. Following this, the two got into contact and Julie visited him at the inn where he was staying. The two must have become very close, as Julie stayed by his side until he recovered. Some stories say that the two went on to fall deeply in love, but this ended when the Duke was sent away to the army. In any case, they became lifelong friends. Julie eventually arrived at the Paris Opera, but initially she wasn't admitted. Yet, she didn't give up, and with the help of certain connections, in 1690, she was accepted into the company. However, while moving around Paris, she had to be discreet, as there was a warrant out for her capture, 
due to the events that occurred in Avignon. Julie was left with no choice than to seek forgiveness. Fortunately, she was still on good terms with the Count of Armagnac and used her charm to persuade him to do all he could so that King Louis XIV would pardon her. Luckily for Julie, the king was amused by her wild adventures, meaning she was now free to do as she pleased. Julie decided to continue in the opera, where she made her debut in December 1690 under the stage name Mademoiselle Mapin. Singing in the opera was a challenge, even for veteran singers, as audiences were known for bad behaviour, from heckling and talking during performances, to even singing along, drowning out the artist's voice. Despite these obstacles, Julie was a success in Paris. The Marquis de Dango later wrote in his journal that she had the most beautiful voice in the world. During this time, she played many roles and took on both male and female lovers. However, it wasn't until she made a fool of one of the company's most popular singers that she really gained the respect of her colleagues. The golden-voiced singer, likely named Dumani, was arrogant and snobbish. Julie disliked his attitude, so when he tried his charms on her, she immediately rejected him, to which he replied by calling her a foul name. It seemed as though a fight was going to break out there and then, but the company intervened, preventing any violence. Later that evening, Julie, who was dressed as a man, patiently waited for him outside the Place de Victoire. Once she spotted him, Julie approached him with threatening behaviour, took out her cane and started beating him with it. The man begged for mercy, yet Julie wasn't the merciful type. Once he'd had enough, she took his snuffbox and timepiece and then left. The following day, Dumani told the whole company how he'd been beaten and robbed by three men, but still managed to defend himself. Julie heard this, claimed he was a liar, and produced the timepiece and snuffbox. Their colleagues laughed, and the man walked off ashamed. After this event, he treated everyone with more respect. Julie remained at the opera for over five years, until one night, her forward and fearsome nature once again got her into trouble. In February 1696, Julie attended a ball hosted by Le Duc d'Orléans. At the event, she was dressed as a man, and a very beautiful young Marquise caught her eye. Julie began to flirt with the young woman, but her three suitors didn't take kindly to this, telling her to leave. In typical fashion, Julie asked the men if they wanted to settle things outside. So during the middle of the night, the four went to a park on the River Seine. Each one had their turn duelling, and each one lost, resulting in serious wounds. Julie returned to the ball, informing the Duke that the men required medical aid. Although this could have led to a serious punishment, it seems as though the King took a liking to Julie's daring and amusing antics, as no charges were brought against her. Again, she had escaped justice, but decided to head to Brussels in case the king changed his mind. While in Brussels, she had an affair with the Elector of Bavaria, Maximilian II. The liaison lasted for a few months, but Maximilian, a notable ladies' man, soon looked for better company. He then ended things with Julie, and as a parting gift, presented her with 40,000 francs. Julie reacted by grabbing the bag and throwing it at the messenger's groin. Despite this, she ended up with a 2,000 franc pension and supposedly headed to Spain. Although there's no evidence supporting the tale, apparently while in Spain, Julie ran out of money and had no other option than to work. She found a job as a lady's maid to Countess Marino, but the two didn't get on in the slightest. One night, Julie helped the Countess prepare for a ball, but as she had now saved up enough money to leave, she decided to exact revenge on the unpleasant Countess. Julie managed to sneak some small radishes into the Countess's hair without her noticing, yet it was clearly visible for everyone else. At the ball, 
crowd snickered and laughed at the Countess. Eventually, she was told of the radishes in her hairdo. Furious, she rushed home to scold Julie, but she had already left for Paris. In November 1698, Julie was once again performing at the Paris Opera. Over the next seven years, she appeared in numerous events, such as operas, concerts, and even parties at the Palace of Versailles. These years were the height of her fame as a singer, but in spite of her success, her chaotic ways continued. Throughout these years, Julie is reported to have attacked her landlord, threatened to shoot a duchess's brains out, and continued her duels and fights with actors when disagreements occurred. In 1703, Julie fell madly in love with the most beautiful woman in France, Madame la Marquise de Florensac. Accounts state that they lived happily for two years, which was Julie's longest ever relationship. It seems that at last, she found true, long-lasting love. However, in 1705, Florence Sack sadly passed away from a fever. Disheartened by her death, Julie retired from the opera in 1705 and took refuge in a convent. She remained there for the rest of her life and passed away just two years later at the age of 33. In 1835, Théophile Gautier published a novel based on her life called Mademoiselle de Marpin. Many of his characters were named after her acquaintances in real life. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Julie Daubigny. If you enjoyed, please leave me a like and a comment down below. And if you're new, why not subscribe? Make sure to have notifications turned on to get all my uploads. And if you have any suggestions, please leave me a comment down below or an email which is found in the description. That's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.